So, last on Friday I mentioned that we might not, we might skip the last part of part A, but then I realized that we have a little bit of time. So I guess we'll go through it because it's a very interesting sort of discussion, very different from what we did for uh, last one week. It's more theoretical and it'll help you in understanding algorithms and uh, that's that's something that they don't teach you in uh, many machine learning courses these days. Uh, most of the courses these days tend to be more uh, uh, algorithmic and, uh, you know, sort of they, they teach you different methods, method oriented, right? But not that much of uh, uh, the theory. So what we are going to do today is look at one way of understanding the complexity of machine learning algorithms. We did one, one similar study in week two when we were looking at mistake bound analysis. And today we are going to look at uh, a different way of uh, doing things. And uh, the reason I put it now after, uh, you know, doing perceptron and neural networks is because right at this moment, now you have looked at many algorithms, right? You have, we have looked at, uh, of course, we started with things like candidate elimination, find S, remember those? And uh, we looked at Winnow, right? And then we also looked at something called perceptron. And then we looked at neural networks. So what each one of these algorithm does is that they make certain assumptions, right? All of them have some inductive bias in them in which, in the sense that they try to, they assume that there's the solution, the true concept lies in a hypothesis space. So each one of them makes this assumption about the hypothesis space. So, so there could be different types of hypothesis spaces. So they could, it could be conjunctive, and that also depends on what type of data you have, right? So things like conjunctive, disjunctive, these logical con, uh, hypothesis spaces only make sense when you have binary attributes. Uh, but then we looked at lines, right? We looked at nonlinear curves, and so. Different algorithms try to, uh, different algorithms assume that the answer lies in one of these spaces and then they are kind of like search algorithm, try to find the right answer, right? Uh, now there are, there are two types of uh, algorithms that we looked at, one in which we assume that, so we call this hypothesis space, we represent it as a fancy H, right? And C is your true concept or target concept that you want to learn. So there are some algorithms that assume that C belongs to H. That means that the true concept is in the hypothesis space and your job is to learn that true concept. And there are others that assume that C does not belong to H, right? So for example, the, the unthresholded, uh, not unthresholded, but the unbi unbiased perceptron, the second perceptron that does uh, gradient descent based learning does not assume that your true concept is really a line, but then it tries to find the closest answer to that. Same happens with neural networks, right? So the hypothesis space for neural networks is, a, is not very easy to define, but essentially the idea is that they assume that the, the architecture of the neural network is the hypothesis space. They assume that the, the true concept can be represented in that form, right? So it's a much bigger hypothesis space, of course, uh, but it is a, a hypothesis space nevertheless. Right, so there are two types of uh, methods that we have seen. So things like candidate elimination and uh, Winnow and even the, the, the first perceptron that we saw, uh, first one, they all lie here. Then the second perceptron, the one that does gradient descent and neural networks, they lie here, right? So today we are going to look at these methods first and then we are going to quickly talk about these methods as well. So what we want to do today is try to understand the complexity of the hypothesis space in the context of algorithms that make this assumption, all right? That your true concept lies in the hypothesis space, right? So we are going to characterize the complexity of hypothesis spaces, but in some, in the some at the same time, we are also trying to assess the complexity of the methods because each hypothesis space is associated with a method, right? So if you have methods that work with certain hypothesis space, you can then understand, okay, how complex is 
how complex a problem is this method trying to solve, right? So, so the first question that comes up is how do you quantify the toughness of a problem or toughness of a hypothesis space? So quantifying complexity of H. So one we have already seen, which is a number of mistake that an online learner would make to learn the concept that falls here, right? So one is number of mistakes. And we did one kind of analysis based on that, which we call mistake bound analysis with respect to Vino and some of the other ones, right? I'll show you the picture and remind you of that. Uh, now, today we are going to look at a slight, a, a different way of quantifying the complexity, which is uh, amount of training data needed. Data required. So we call that number M. So how much training data do we need to learn our uh, target? Okay. Uh, so, so we are going to move away from number of mistakes. We are going to look at M instead. And it is, it is nice because if we can understand that, then what we can understand is, okay, here is a neural network, right? How much training do, data do I need to learn a reasonable one, right? You, uh, in your assignment, you are looking at 50,000 training examples. Now the question is, do we really need 50,000? Could we have done the same thing with 20,000 or 10,000, right? Or 10. So it depends on the complexity of the hypothesis space. But by understanding these things, you can answer that. Like, okay, this is a neural network. I need at least 500 examples or, or so on, right? Same thing with perceptron. So, so those are the kind of questions that we, we can answer by doing this kind of analysis, okay? Now, the first thing I want you to remember is when we were looking at mistake bound analysis, right? <clears throat> Right. So remember this mistake bound analysis where we are trying to understand the worst case complexity of any algorithm over any training data to learn any concept that is in the hypothesis space, right? And we put some bounds there. One of the issues with this kind of analysis is that it is too strict because it is trying to get you the worst case bounds, right? So usually the bounds that you get with this are very general. It says, of course, one thing is it's trying to quantify the number of mistakes, but the bounds that you get are very large because it is trying to put a bound on the worst case. So any algorithm that I take, what would be its performance for any data set in a, or the what would be its worst case performance over all possible training data sets and of, over all possible concepts, right? So it's a, it's a pretty strict requirement that we are trying to, uh, you know, address in mistake bound analysis. What people realize is that in general, when you are using machine learning in practice, worst cases do not happen that often, right? Usually you would be in sort of an expected case, right? Uh, so if you assume that your data is being generated from some distribution, right? So we, we are going to talk about distributions uh, on Friday, but uh, so when I talk about distribution today, just think of it as a process that generates your data, all right? So when you have data that is being generated from a distribution, typically, whatever training data that you get, you can assume that it would be, you know, it would follow the distribution. So instead of trying to do this worst case analysis, what we want to do is sort of an average case analysis, okay? How much typically, what would be the uh, error that you would incur if you use M training data points, right? So that is the idea behind this new analysis that we are going to do today, right? Another thing that we want to do is that instead of so, okay, so now what, what do we mean? So remember this line in the end, which is how many training examples are sufficient to learn the target concept? That is what we want to understand today, right? But what does it mean that you have learned the target concept? Does it mean that your error on the training data is zero, which, which is fair, right? You can make your error in, on the training data zero, but does it also mean that your error on the test data, which is unseen data, has to be zero as well. Is that your definition of a good learner, right? And it is reasonable. That's what you would expect so given, given that you're assuming that your C belongs to the hypothesis space. But that kind of assumption leads to, again, very general bounds. It's very hard to put bounds with those unrealistic assumptions. So think about it. We are trying to 
find how much training data we need so that a particular algorithm can learn a concept which will make zero error on the training data, right? Plus, it would make zero error on any test data, right? That's too strict uh, an assumption. And, you know, mathematically, it's very hard to derive bounds to, for that, right? Typically, the bounds, there are like infinity. So you will need at least inf infinite number of training examples. So it's not a very uh, useful bound, right? We want something tighter so that we can use it. So to do that, what computer scientists did was they relaxed this expectation. They said, okay, let us not try to find uh, an example. Uh, uh, let us not try to learn a, uh, a concept which does zero error on test data. But let us try to say, okay, it's okay if it does epsilon number of errors. Right? So we are, we are okay in accommodating epsilon error rate. So, I, so I'm introducing this term epsilon now, which is that instead of assuming that you're, so we, of course, we assume that on training data, the error is zero because this is a consistent learner, right? We assume that C is in H. So let us assume that on training data, error is zero, but we do not expect the error on test data to be, um, to be zero. We can accommodate epsilon error. So that is what one thing that we relax it with. And there's one more relaxation that we do, which I'll introduce in, in a bit. So, so this whole way of looking at algorithms is also called probably approximately correct learning. So PAC, or, or we, uh, so I'll refer to it as PAC from now on. So PAC learning. So what it does is it says that let us not try to assess algorithms in terms of how they can behave perfectly, but only if they can behave probably a correct, right? So we do not want it to be perfect, but close to perfect. And then we want to find the bounds on M, which is the number of training examples that you need to, to reach that state, okay? And this is a theory that was uh, proposed by Leslie Valiant in uh, 1978. And he actually got the Turing Award in 2011, I think. I forgot. But yes, yeah, so somewhere around that time. So very powerful sort of a uh, theory to understand the, the the properties of algorithms, okay? Any questions so far? All right. So, I mean, listen carefully. This is, there's less math here, uh, more of just trying to understand what it is, right? So let us try to understand this whole logic with a sort of a dialogue. So it's a story, right? So in this story, there are two people. There's one person who is who is the producer of the algorithm, who is trying to sell an algorithm. And on the other side, there's a person who needs an algorithm, right? So there's a negotiation going on between them. So on one side, the algorithm producer is claiming that he has an algorithm which can distinguish, so it's a binary classifier, between malignant and benign tumors. That gives 0% training error. So it's consistent. And only 5% error on one test data set after learning from one training data set. So these are the kind of claims that you can make, you know, based on one setting, right? So, and the, it's unfortunate, but many of the machine learning papers that you'll read these days, they kind of do the same thing, right? So they say, here's my new machine learning algorithm, and I trained it on this training data, and I tested it on this one, tested it on this one, and I got this performance, right? And then they just publish it. And you would think that, if I change my training data and change my test data, it would still be the same, but that's not what happens, right? So the producers kind of are on this side, while the buyer, people like us who want to use these algorithms, the kind of guarantees that we need is that it can distinguish between any type of tumor, which means any concept, not just one type of conjunctive concept, for example, but any conjunctive concept, with 0% training error and 5% error rate on any test data after learning from any training data. So that is the kind of guarantee that we need. And these are the kind of guarantees that the producers provide. So how do we come in the middle, right? How can we take that algorithm and figure out if it can do this, this which we need, all right? So, so let's go through this story. So the producer says, you know, here's my algorithm, take it. The buyer says, Will it work as you advertise, right? Which is 0% training error, 5% test error. The producer says it will as long as you're using the exact same training data I use and the same test data that I use and the same concept that I use to dif differentiate 
the, the concept that differentiated the two types of points, right? Remember, in conjunctive concepts, you can have many conjunctive concepts, right? So what this producer is saying is that for one particular conjunctive concept, and for that same data and same test data, this is how it will work. But the buyer, what the buyer needs is guarantees on if any of this changes, right? Change the concept, change the training data, change the test data. So then comes the interesting question, right? How does you, how do you figure this out, right? So let's say the producer comes back and says, okay, can you provide me some guarantee on how much training data there will be, which is kind of the thing that we are trying to do, which is M, right? So let's say buyer says, okay, uh, I cannot guarantee that I can give you infinite training data. That doesn't make sense, right? But maybe you can tell me how much do you really need? Like what is the smallest size you can work with? So the producer, of course, it's, so it turns out that with these assumptions, right? So what I'm trying to do right now is trying to relax the assumptions on our analysis. So it turns out that only with these many assumptions, it's very hard to work, right? So what the producer needs is, okay, can I relax it a little bit? Says, at least can I assume that the data is generated by a distribution, okay? Which is a process that is generating the data. And the buyer says, okay, you can, but I will not tell you what D is. But all I'll tell you is that the training data and the test data, they all are coming from the same distribution. So, so again, so we have made a slight relaxation here. Producer says, I can still not give you guarantees, right? Because it is still very hard to give guarantees with only these many assumptions. So then we relax it a little bit. We say, okay, how about, we, how about if the learner, if it is okay to have epsilon error rate. Error rate means that if I take uh, 10 um, or 100 training examples or test examples, then error rate of 10 means it makes mistakes on 10 of them, right? So let's say it relaxes it, produce, but it, this one is still hard. You can still not give you guarantees. So the, another relaxation that I may, we make is that what if we do not learn that hypothesis, that epsilon error hypothesis, something that we will call a reasonable hypothesis every time. So if we can relax that a little bit, so, so another relaxation is that it is okay if you do not learn the desired hypothesis delta fraction of the time. So here is how it works, right? So let's say this is your D, uh, the distribution. Every time you get a training data set, you learn your algorithm, right? And then you test it on test data. You want that algorithm to perform one uh, with one minus delta, oh sorry, one minus epsilon accuracy, right? But you want this to happen not every time, but just one minus delta times. One minus uh, delta times here, right? So now we have this, relax it a little more. So this is what we call probably approximately correct algorithms. So they are approximate because they only perform one minus epsilon accurate accuracy and they only do that one minus delta times, not every time, right? So that is the idea. So with these assumptions, now we can come up with bounds like this. So we will see how to derive this, but I've just jumped the gun a little bit. But the idea is that if you make all of these assumptions that there is some acceptable error rate, there is some acceptable failure rate, and there is, of course, there's a hypothesis space, then the number of training data that you need to learn, right, is this. And we'll see how to derive that. But this is the kind of analysis that we want to do. Because with this, now we know that for any hypothesis, any error rate and any uh, um, failure rate, and depending on the size of your hypothesis space, the amount of training data that we need will, will change. So before we derive this, so the idea is that if we can quantify this, right, if we can figure out what is the size of my hypothesis space, then you can actually find this number very precisely. So for instance, if you remember conjunctive concepts, right? So we knew what H is for conjunctive concepts, which means that we can come up with this bounds. Same thing with K disjunctive concepts and so on. And later on, we'll see what happens if H is uh, if H is not finite, right? So, for example, in lines, in perceptrons, that you you can have infinite lines. That means you cannot just put infinity here. That won't make sense. So then there is another way of defining the size of your hypothesis space. But this kind of uh, process still works. Any questions so far? Yes. Uh huh. 
with epsilon error rate. So the question is, what does that failure mean, right? So the idea is, in the pack learning, So there's a notion of a acceptable uh, hypothesis, a hypothesis uh, result, right? Acceptable hypothesis is one which makes makes at most errors, right? Or error rate, right? So that is an acceptable hypothesis. What we want this learn this learner to do is to learn this acceptable hypothesis only one minus delta times. So, so you can uh, so let's say you uh, you run a loop, right? So for i equal to one through hundred, you say that i my training data. So t is my training data sample that is coming from that distribution, right? sample from the distribution D, right? And then uh, let's say H is the hypothesis that you get after you train on T, right? And let's say error is the error of H on any test data that's sampled from D, right? So that's the error rate. So if this error rate, let's call it error rate, error rate, is less than or equal to epsilon, right? Which means that it was an acceptable hypothesis. Then you will say that then we say that we have some counter. Let's say some counters k. K becomes k plus one. Okay, so k is zero here. And then this loop ends over here. So if k divided by 100, because there were total 100 times you did that, is greater, is less than delta, then it is a pack, pack learner, right? Because out of 100 times, at least k times you learned a good hypothesis. So the by good we mean a reasonable one, the one which has an error rate of less than epsilon. So what you see here is that we are relaxing the expectations on the algorithm. It doesn't have to be perfect on test data and it doesn't have to be even approximate every time, only one minus delta time. Then we can get bounds that I'll show you, the bounds that we showed earlier. All right, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, no, it has to be greater than. Uh, yeah, yeah, it will be fine. So, because your del is two. No, no, no. So, remember, del is a number of times you can make a mistake. Number of mistakes that you can make. Oh, sorry. Number of times you can fail right, to learn the reasonable uh, thing. So if your, if your del is two, let's say you say, I'm only going to allow it at not more than two, then it is, but you made, uh, you failed to learn it 99 times actually, right, in your example. So k is the number of times you are failing, or you are, you are succeeding. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, so actually I should flip this then. If error rate is, because k is how we measure the number of times you fail, you see? So k is number of times, so if it has, it has to be less than delta, you see what I mean? Right. Any questions? Yes. Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm generalizing a lot because this is just a sort of a, a, a vague sketch, right? It's very hard to do this testing, which is because you'll have to go and take every possible test example and figure out that error rate. So it's not easy, right? But it's just sort of a hypothetical case that you can measure it. But every time this will change. So there will be another loop here where you would actually go and get every test instance and sort of measure the error rate. 
which would be different from the training instance. So the training data and the test data will keep changing in every loop. There was a question over there? Yeah. How do we come to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll derive that now. All right. Okay. So with that question, let's let's move forward. So now we need to figure out, okay, what is the, uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it needs to be acceptable, which means it can only make less than or equal to epsilon errors at least one minus del times. Right. So only del times it can be a failure in that sense. Okay. All right. So now let's see how to how to get a bound on M for that kind of definition. So for any algorithm, which is a consistent learner, of course, we are assuming that C belongs to H, can we find what is the bound on M? How much M do we need for it to follow this, right? Because we didn't say what is the size of, so let's say this is size, so size of T is M, right? So how much M we need to get this kind of performance? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so the error, so that's important. So there are two terms I introduced, error rate and failure, right? And I use a term epsilon here and I use a term delta here, right? So error means that once you have learned your hypothesis, once you have done the training, right? And now you try that algorithm on your test data. So how many mistakes you make, okay? Given a trained model, a trained hypothesis, a learned hypothesis, how many errors do I make on test examples? So you can, in, in terms of probability, you can define it as that if I take one test example, what is the probability that I will misclassify it? So that is the error rate, right? Uh, so, so that is that, right? So if I, so you can mathematically you can say probability that H of X is not equal to the true label C of X, right? For, for all X that belongs to your, your, or it's generated from your test data or from your distribution, right? So for any. Now, this failure is defined, so if, failure is defined for the training process. So if you get a hypothesis which cannot learn this, this kind of, uh, which cannot give you this kind of error rate. So if error rate of some trained hypothesis H is greater than epsilon, right? That means it's, it's, it makes more than epsilon error, then it is a failure. You fail if you are not able to learn this kind of hypothesis, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, so it might not be a failure. So see, let, let's do it this way. So what we do in this whole process, right, is that we first, so we, we, we have an algorithm, right, let's say it's uh, our uh, find s algorithm, right. So first thing it does is it takes a training data example, training data sample, right, of some size m, and then it trains, it learns the hypothesis, right, and then it measures its error on all of your test data, right, and then it says, is this error rate? Uh, so let's say, uh, so you first, first step is you sample training data. Step two is learn H using your algorithm, right? Number three is measure number of mistakes on all test data. Like test data means everything else. All right, 
and let's say there are capital N test data examples, right? And the number of mistakes is, and then you say, so my error rate will be number of mistakes divided by N, right? So now what we do, so this is my error rate. Now we see if error rate is greater than uh, epsilon. So if it is greater than that number that we have specified, epsilon, then we say it is a failure. Otherwise it's a success, right? And then what we do is we do this process over and over and over again every time we sample a new training data set and then we measure how many times we fail. And then what we do is then we compute our uh, uh, computer failure rate, which is, okay, number of trials I did, how many times did I fail out of those? So that is the whole idea. No, so error rate will be measured after you learn. So every time you learn, you will get a classifier or some uh, hypothesis, right? Now you can use it to test your entire test data and measure the error rate, right? So that will be your error rate. Then you compare it to this epsilon. Epsilon is a constant that we have defined, right? And if it is greater than epsilon, then you say it is a failure. And then you keep adding up all your failures and at the end you can compute your failure rate, all right? Any other questions? All right, so now let us see how to, how to get these bounds, right? So the first thing we want to do is introduce this notion or actually reacquaint ourselves to this notion of a version space, right? If you guys remember, version space is all your hypotheses which are in your, which are consistent with your training data, right? So all the hypotheses which makes zero error on your training data. So that is version space. Mathematically, you can write it like this, right? So given your training data D, any hypothesis such that it does not make any mistake on your, uh, any example in the training data, that will be in the version space, right? So these are set of hypotheses with zero training error, right? So now we want to figure out, okay, can my algorithm learn a pack learnable or acceptable hypothesis? That's what my aim is, right? So one observation I make is that if the version space only has the acceptable hypotheses. So remember, version space will have hypotheses which have training error of zero, but they can have any test error, right? We don't know that. So if my version space has only those hypotheses whose test error is less than epsilon, then I am good, right? Because what will happen is, so let's say this is my old, uh, whole, um, whole space of hypothesis, right, H. And inside there, there is a version space. Of course, version space is defined for a data set, right? So you can't uh, end the hypothesis space. So, so if you take any hypothesis from here, so for, let's say H, H belongs to version space, then we know that training error will be zero, right? But we can't make any guarantees on what will be the test error, right? But what I want to say is that if, if the test error for each one of them is less than epsilon, which means that each one of them is an acceptable hypothesis defined by our pack learning uh, framework, then our algorithm will always learn an acceptable hypothesis, right? Because, because our uh, since the learner, right, whatever our algorithm is, is consistent. That means it always tries to find, it always tries to find the hypothesis which gives you zero training error, right? That's the idea of a consistent hypothesis. It means that it will always try to find H from here, right? And if we can somehow show that this, every H here has training or test error less than epsilon, then we can prove that yes, it will always learn an acceptable hypothesis, right? So right now, there is no guarantee that for H belongs to this version space, the test error is less than epsilon, right? We don't know that. 
because it's a test error. But if we can, so if we can compute the probability that every hypothesis here does have a test error greater than epsilon, then we are good because then we can, our, our learner will also learn an acceptable hypothesis, right? Because it always finds a hypothesis from here. So that is the point. So now what we want to find is, we want to provide a bound. We want to, we want to show what is the bound on M, which is size of our training data, such that the version space does not contain any unacceptable, unacceptable means its test error rate is greater than epsilon. So test error rate So that is a question that we are trying to answer. All right, any questions so far? Okay, good. So I'm going to introduce a term called epsilon exhausted version space. Okay, so what is an epsilon exhausted version space? If every hypothesis in version space is, uh, is acceptable, right? so it's a diff simple definition. So what we want to find out now is what is the probability of getting an epsilon exhausted version space. So the idea is how much data do you need so that your version space is ep epsilon exhausted. Why? Because once your version space is epsilon exhausted, that means every hypothesis in that version space is an acceptable hypothesis, which means that the learner will learn that hypothesis, right? So that is the logic. So if we can compute the probability of getting this, basically we, we get our result, right? So the way to do this is, yes. No, what kind of error? Training error? Yeah, so see, it's a version space, so the training error will always be zero. All right, so we are talking about a test error now. See, again, so what I meant was that if it is a version space, then every hypothesis here will have a zero training error. That is true. But there is no guarantee that its t test error will be less than epsilon, right? We don't know that. So what we want to show now is that because the test, all right. So what we want to show is that what is the guarantee that this will be epsilon exhausted? That how can we show that whatever we have here will have at least epsilon, I mean, will not have more than epsilon test error rate, right? So training error rate of, training error will always be zero because this is a version space. But the test error, we want to figure out when will it be epsilon exhausted, which means that every hypothesis is acceptable. It has less than epsilon error rate, right? So the way to prove this is to look at another theorem. So this is a theorem. The theorem says that if your H is finite, of course, we are talking about finite hypothesis spaces, and let's say D is your training data set with M examples, which are coming from a process, which is this distribution D then the probability that this version space is not epsilon exhausted is less than equal to this number. So we'll derive this, okay? So this is the theorem that says that this is the probability that your version space is not epsilon exhausted is this, or at least this, less than equal to this. Uh, so how do we look at that, right? So, so I'm not going to go through the very detailed proof. It's there in that uh, thing, but I'm going to introduce it to you anyway. <clears throat> right. So let's look at this, right? So we want to show what is the probability that our version space is not epsilon exhaust, which means that there is at least one bad hypothesis in that, right? When, when I say bad means unacceptable hypothesis, right? So let's say this is our version space Vs, yeah? 
Now let's say a, there are k bad hypotheses in your entire hypothesis space. Let's say h1, h2 all the way to hk are unacceptable hypotheses. in the whole hype space, right? So what we want to understand is what is the probability that any one of them will be inside, right? So if they're unacceptable implies that uh, for all h i, will, uh, you know, i from 1 through k, the error rate, the test error rate of h i will be greater than epsilon, right? Because they are bad. So they're unacceptable. Now we want to see what is the problem that these will be inside, right? Now, for h i, i equal to 1 through k, to be in version space, right, training error of h i should be 0, because that's the definition of version space, right? So, here is a hypothesis whose error rate is greater than epsilon, right? But we want to find out what is the probability that its error rate on our m training examples will be zero. So that is sort of because if that is true then it will be in the version space and then this version space will not be epsilon exhausted, right? So to compute that probability essentially this is how we do it, right? So we say let pi be probability that h i <clears throat> is consistent or has zero error on m examples which are coming from d, right? Implies that training error or the error on these examples is equal to 0. This is what this means, right? So let pi be that probability that it is, uh, so, uh, right? So now if I, so the probability that 1 of h1 through hk will be in version space, right, will be equal to summation of pi, right? Because pi is the probability that hi has zero training error, which means that it can be in virgin space. So probability that any one of these is in the virgin space is just a sum of them, right? These are mutually exclusive uh, events. So you can just add them up and that's the summation. All right. But what you also see is that since But the, tr the true error or the test error, right, of h i is greater than or equal to epsilon because it's an unacceptable hypothesis, which means that probability implies that for any example, if I take any example, the probability of h i to be consistent with this, with the example, is will be less than 1 minus epsilon, right? Because the t error rate, the test error of hi is greater than epsilon, which means that if I take any example, it this hi will make a mistake but with more than epsilon probability because that's why it is an unacceptable hypothesis which means that if I take an example the probability of it to be correct on that is less than 1 minus epsilon right which means that probability of hi to be consistent with m examples because our training it has m examples will be less than 1 minus epsilon raised to m right because the uh, these are all events that are independent so the probability of it uh, so if i take a training data the probability that it will be correct on the first one is less than 1 minus epsilon second one 1 minus epsilon third one and so on so the total probability that it will be the whole data set the training data set will be consistent 
will be less than 1 minus epsilon raised to power m, right? So now, if I look at this, right? So if I sum this up, then the probability that 1 of h1 through hk will be in Vs will be less than equal to summation 1 minus epsilon raised to power m, right? Because this is, I'm going to, I'm replacing this with this, which will be equal to, which will be less than equal to k 1 minus epsilon raised to power m, because there are k, k of these, right? 1 through k. So this is the probability that any one of these will be in Vs, right? Which means that this is the probability that this will not be epsilon exhaust. That's what I was trying to uh, prove earlier, right? Now another thing we can see, we are going to make a simplification. K will always be less than H, right? So K is the number of hypotheses that could be bad, right? So since the H can have at the most size of H hypothesis, that means K will always be less than or equal to that, right? So it implies that, so I'm going to do this, that this probability, probability that H1 through HK will be in Vs, which is exactly the same probability as it not being epsilon exhausted, will be less than or equal to size of H 1 minus epsilon raised to power M, right? So, and then we are going to do a slight uh, sort of mathematical trick. So, I'm going to use a result which is fairly general inequality, right? Which means that 1 minus epsilon is always less than or equal to e power epsilon, okay? For epsilon between 0 and 1. Now, epsilon is, is a rate, so it's between 0 and 1. So, I'm just going to use this result. So, this will be same as Okay, so this is a known result, so let's leave it at that, right. So this is basically what we wanted to prove, right. So the probability that, that theorem, probability that the version space is not epsilon exhausted is less than or equal to so this is our theorem that we prove. Now, how does it help us, right? So the way, way it helps us is that now, so this is the probability that the version space will not be epsilon exhausted, right? So which means that if, so this is our failure, this is a case of a failure, right? Which means that we will learn a bad hypothesis, an, an unacceptable hypothesis. So if you want to figure out what is the probability of not learning a bad hypothesis at all, you can use this term, right? So in next class, we will sort of use this to connect to our initial result that we had, that Samuel Jackson sort of gave you, which is this. It will come from that. So we'll, we'll come to that next time. Any questions? Yes. Oh, that is just to get a result. So this, this, uh, this change from here to here is just to make it mathematically nicer to work with. There is nothing there. I mean, uh, as long as this is less than this, so this probability will still be bounded, right? The reason we are doing it that is because with that we will be able to get to that result that I showed you earlier. Okay, so there is there is no. I mean, it's it's just a way to keep make it simpler. All right, thank you very much. I'll see you on um, Wednesday.